Chapter 20. One spring when Alice and Jesse were in high school, I found myself a little short on cash. I hadn't sold sage hens for a year or two, and for there had been a law passed prohibiting the sale of them. Now I needed the money for the girls, so I had Daddy get me a couple dozen birds. I knew it was unlawful, but needing the money, I took the chance. I had my birds all sold, and most of them delivered, when I was standing in the street corner talking to an old friend. A man I had sold some bird to walked by and nudged me with his elbow. Thinking it was an accident, I paid no attention to him. He turned and walked back and nudged me again. When I looked up at him, he grinned and winked. I thought, well, you old cuss, you knowing me all these years and you're trying to get fresh with me? I turned my back on him, but heard his footsteps clicking down the sidewalk. I knew he turned and was headed back toward me. This time he gave me quite a jolt with his elbow and motioned for me to follow him. As he stepped round the corner, I followed. I thought, old fella, we'll see what this is all about. He fell in step with me, but never looked my way. Out of the corner of his mouth, he said, If you got any sage hens in your car, for God's sakes, dump em quick. The game warden's after you. He turned abruptly and left me. I went down the street, praying as I'd never prayed before. Oh, God, please don't let them send me to jail. I'll never sell another bit of game as long as I live. I knew my high school girls would be terribly embarrassed if their mother was arrested. I did some fast walking, some quick thinking, and some fervent praying in the next few minutes. I dumped the birds and returned the money to those who had paid for them. That was years ago, and I kept my promise ever since never to sell game again, and I've been a law-abiding citizen ever since. After having bought the Merry Widow's Ranch and the cabin from the bartender's dream, we had enough lumber from the two houses on the property to add on to our own house. We made a long living room and two extra bedrooms, making seven rooms in all. Our school teacher had a room of her own, and the schoolroom was used solely for school. Minnie's the dance and social affair we've held in our big living room. All the young folks from twenty or thirty miles around joined us in our fun. When our older girls, Jessie and Alice, were in high school in Reno, then the place did become a popular place for dances. The girls would ride out and say, We're coming for a dance on Saturday night. Not may we come, but we're coming. They would write to many of their friends in the surrounding country and arrange to have them come. At the appointed hour, four or five cars of young folks from Reno could be spotted making their way towards the ranch. They always got there in time for supper. The others would come later. There was always plenty of music, for Edson played his accordion, and one or two cowboys played the guitar. Sometimes we would wind up the phonograph and have a little canned music with someone standing by it to keep it wound up. We would dance till midnight when I would serve coffee and cake. Then the dance continued until daylight when most of the dancers would go home. By then, the Reno boys and girls would take a nap, the boys retiring to the haystacks and the girls in any comfortable spot they could find around the house. They would awaken about three in the afternoon, have a big Sunday dinner, and then go home. Although these parties were always a lot of work for me, I enjoyed them as much as the girls did. Sometimes the girls would bring a few friends out for Sunday dinner. One such time, I had a bunch of horses in the corral all ready to take on the mountain the next day. I was going to drive them over the top of the mountain and down into Mud Springs, three miles on the other side. By taking them over there, they wouldn't return home until roundup time in the fall. I had just gotten the horses corralled at 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoon when Leslie came home with the mail. In it was a letter from the girls saying they'd be home the next day, Sunday, with some friends. Please have dinner ready at noon. We have to be back in town early, the letter read. They wanted me to have fried chicken and strawberry shortcake for dinner. It made things a little complicated for me, but I knew it could be done if I stretched the day a little. At 2 a.m., Leslie and I started out with the horses. It was June, but going over the summit of Toole, we crossed a big snowbank. I thought, if I could bring down some of that snow, I could make some homemade ice cream for the girls to go with their shortcake. I nearly always carried a gunny sack over my saddle, but this time there was no sack on either saddle. Ha! <sighs> my, how I wanted that snow! The ice cream would be such a treat for the girls and their friends. The rest of the way down to Mud Spring, I kept wondering to myself, how can I get that snow? By the time I got back to the snowbank, I had a way figured out. I always wear long underwear when riding on the mountain. This day I was dressed in the usual riding skirt, with each leg containing three yards of material. I took off the skirt and tore up a clean handkerchief for strings with which to hold the bottoms of the legs together. Then I filled the legs of the skirt with snow and tied it on the back of the saddle with the saddle strings. I rode home the rest of the way in my longies. 
As we neared home, Leslie and I peeked around boulders and juniper trees to see if any of our company had arrived. If so, I would have to sneak in the back way. Fortunately, there was no cars in sight. We were cleaned up and dressed with dinner ready and ice cream made when the happy, laughing company arrived. Leslie and I made an 18-mile ride, prepared dinner and dessert by the time the girls arrived, but as a storyteller would say, a good time was had by all. In 1917, we were about to lose our school. Jesse and Alice were in town at school, and Edson had quit several years before, thinking Ma needed his help more than he needed an education. That left only our three younger ones in school. If one of them would miss a day or two of school, we would fall short of our daily attendance. Again came the big question, what shall I do? I decided to stuff the school roll, that is, to take in children to board, so they could attend our school. I heard of a homesteader over in Red Rock Valley that had three little children but no school for them to attend. I drove over in the Ford and made arrangements to board these his little girls from Monday to Friday without charge in order to have them on our school row. It was cheaper for me to board his children on the ranch, where we raised so much of our own food, than to have to give up the school and board our little ones in town. In this way, I stuffed the school roll for five years until Leslie and Albert went to Reno for high school, leaving Martha in the sixth grade. Our state school superintendent received word that we had only one child of our own in school, and I was notified that the school would be closed. I made one more gallant try to hang on to the school. I drove to Carson City to the superintendent's office and tried to talk him into continuing our school until the children could finish their grades but my persuasiveness was to no avail. He pointed out that it was illegal and also very wrong if I had stuffed the role with children whose parents did not live in our district. I didn't see it his way. The homesteaders' children had no other chance to an education except what our little school offered to them. I knew I had lost, so I admitted, I'm guilty, but I'm not a darn bit sorry. I only wish I could have held on to it that way for two more years. Our school was gone. We still had Leslie and Albert in high school, and Martha not yet through the grades. I had promised myself to give the children a high school education at the very least. Daddy wanted to quit right there, but I refused. We were not going to quit until the last three children had a high school diploma. Some way we must keep on. I had a plan, but I wondered how I'd ever talk Daddy into agreeing to it. We always had such a difference in opinions. I decided that I could rent a house in town for the winter and take in university girls to board. I figured that I could make enough to support the three children and myself with enough left over to hire a man to stay at the ranch with Daddy. Things worked out my way. They were short on girls' dormitories, and the dean of women was looking frantically for good homes in which to place girls. I rented a five-bedroom house and obtained references as to my worth and ability from local businessmen, and the dean of women promised that she would fill my house for me. I had gone ahead with my plans without a word to Daddy, but now I had to break it to him, for he had to sign the lease. My next problem was how to get him to do it. Again, I had the feeling that I was doing right and that some way it would work out. I made an appointment with the landlord to meet him in town with my husband to sign the lease and drove home. I think Daddy and I came nearer to having a serious quarrel over that project than we ever had in our lives. I approached him saying, Daddy, I have a proposition to make. A plan I want to explain. Promise to keep still and listen, without interrupting, for three minutes, and then I'll let you have your say, and I'll listen. I talked fast, telling him everything I had done, and ended up by saying, I want you to come in with me and sign that lease. He listened, outwardly calm and unperturbed, and when I had finished, he hit the roof. I confess I cheated. He had listened to me, but I turned a deaf ear on him for the next ten days. I never opposed him. I never answered him. The children and I began to put up a second crop of hay and get everything in order for the move to town. I felt confident that things would work out. One day, as I was topping out the last haystack, our neighbors, the Jones family from twenty miles away, drove in to visit us. I called out to them, "'Go in, talk to Daddy for a few minutes. I'll be in to get dinner as soon as I finish this haystack.' We finished the job, and I went into the house and sat in the living room for, to visit for a few minutes. Almost the first thing Mrs. Jones said to me was, I heard you lost your school, and I'm so sorry. What in the world are you going to do? Right then I had inspiration. I'll let Daddy answer the question, I thought. I excused myself and hurried out to the kitchen to make a fire. I made lots of noise, rattling in the stove and banging pots and pans, but kept one ear cocked to hear what was being said in the next room. Just as I thought she would, Ms. Jones repeated the question. To my delight, I heard Daddy answer, Well, by George, the old lady and I talked it over and decided that our last three children deserve an education the same as the rest. I have decided. 
I, mind you, to send the old lady into Reno to run a student's boarding house. With what she earns there, and with the beef money from here, there will be enough to support us and hire a man to take care of the ranch. There, I knew it would work out. Beauty of it was, Daddy thought it was all his decision. He went in with me at the appointed time to sign the lease, and I was running a girl's boarding house. Financially, everything worked out well. I stayed the nine-month school term, but I was never so glad to get home in my life. I wasn't cut out to be a city dweller nor a boarding house keeper. I decided then if I ever had to choose between hell and a girl's boarding house, the boarding house would lose. I would never again leave Daddy and the ranch in someone else's care. There would have to be some other way to get Albert and Martha through high school, but again a way was offered. The following year, Jessie was married, and Martha went to live with her in Hawthorne, Nevada, finishing high school there. Albert worked his way through high school, paying his own way in town, and Leslie entered the university. And I feel like New York City. And I feel like New York City Get me to the farm